The announcements today are first and foremost, the dinner on Thursday. I want to thank everybody who helped with preparing the meal, distributing the meal, just all those who were involved. Uh, trust me, I had one of the meals and it was fantastic. So I encourage anybody to buy a meal for next time because it was really, really good. Um, and also there are dishes in the vestry for all those who donated food, please pick your dishes up. Also, our daily bread. We have our daily bread here. If anybody would like a copy of September, October, and November, I believe it is, yep. They are also in the vestry. There's a basket in the vestry. And if you want this copy, please feel free. They are out there waiting to be taken and enjoyed. On Monday, uh, the Uplift Cancer Support Group will meet at church at 3 o'clock. On Tuesday, uh, there is a prayer group at 7 o'clock via Zoom, followed by a discussion on chapters 22 and 23 of A Praying Life. Thursday, the first interfaith council meeting of the year will be held at 11.45 a.m. We will also have choir practice at 7 o'clock here at church. Next Sunday, by the way, is Labor Day. Can't believe summer's already over. Uh, on the 4th, you're invited to a Christian concert featuring Tim Timmons at 4 o'clock at Horseshoe Acres Campground. The concert is free but you will have an opportunity to give a donation if you would like to. You are also invited to enjoy a campground amenities before the concert and stay for the picnic following the concert. And the address is in the bulletin if you need it. Uh, we're gonna wish a happy birthday this week to Aiden Russell on Wednesday and Bruce Fielding on Friday. The flowers this morning are given by Linda Hewlett in honor of Linda Bushy's birthday. And our word of preparation this morning comes from Psalm 95, one through three. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods.
worship this morning comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. This is from the message. Please join me in reading the bold face. If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in community, the Spirit, means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other, love each other, be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave because he became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death, and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond any mo anyone or anything ever, so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow in worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. Willingly our knees will bow with 
as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
There were many partners in Christ's service in the first century. Some of them are better known because their names are mentioned a lot. Some of them have letters that they wrote or letters that were addressed to them. And, but as we saw in last week in John Mark's story, their paths crossed often, and they spread the news of God's grace with each other. And they encouraged the, the Christians in the churches that were emerging from the, their work of the gospel. Our scripture passage today gives us a glimpse of Paul's second and third missionary journeys. He was on the move for nearly a decade, traveling from one place to the next, staying a bit longer in some of them, like we'll see today, just as the Spirit of God directed him. So our story is picking up this morning in Greece, which is also called Acacia, with Paul entering a large city called Corinth. The Romans had actually destroyed the city when they conquered it in 146 BC, and then they rebuilt the city about a century later. So now it's another century, 49 AD, and Paul is coming to Corinth, and it's the home of an estimated 50,000 people, many of whom have emigrated from other places in the Roman Empire. When Paul arrives, he meets two remarkable people, Priscilla and Aquila, who had recently moved to Corinth from Rome. They're a married couple who serve God together, so we'll get kind of a little bit of a two-for-one as we highlight one last person in this series of lesser-known people on the Bible. I've chosen this morning to focus primarily on Priscilla because it's more rare for a woman to be commended as a theological teacher in scripture. Priscilla is actually a diminutive name of the Roman name Prisca. So it's kind of like a nickname, like if we have a person named James and we call him Jim, or a person named Dorothy and we call them Dottie. Priscilla means ancient or venerable, and in case you don't use the word venerable very often, it, it means given a great deal of respect, especially because of age, wisdom, or character. I believe you'll find that Priscilla's story matches her name. As Ken reads Acts chapter 18, I encourage you to listen for things Priscilla does and the way she does them that reflect a Christ-centered heart. This is Acts chapter 18. After this, after this, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to depart from Rome. Paul approached them, and because he worked at the same trade, he stayed with them and worked with them, for they were tent makers by trade. He addressed both Jews and Greeks in the synagogue every Sabbath, attempting to persuade them. Now when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul became wholly absorbed with proclaiming the word, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. When they opposed him and reviled him, he protested by shaking out his clothes and said to them, your blood be are in your own heads. I am guiltless. From now on I, will go on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went to the house of a person named Titus Justus, a Gentile who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the president of the synagogue believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians who heard about, heard about it believed and were baptized. The Lord said to Paul by a vision in the night, do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent because I am with you 
and no one will assault you to harm you. Because I have many people in this city. So he stayed there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Now, while Galileo was pro proconsul of Achaia, the Jews attacked Paul together and brought him before the judgment seat, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God in a way contrary to the law. But just as Paul was about to speak, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of some crime or serious piece of validity, sorry, sorry, violiny, I would have been justified in accepting the complaint of you Jews. But since it concerns points of disagreement about words and names and your own law, settle it yourselves. I will not be a judge of these things. Then he, <clears throat> excuse me, then he had them forced away from the judgment seat. So they all seized, seized Santhinus, Sustinus, the president of the synagogue, and began to beat him in front of the judgment seat. Yet some of these things were of any concern to Galileo. Paul, after staying many more days in Corinth, and said farewell to the brothers and sisters away to Syria. Accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila, he had his hair cut off at Sancria because he had made a vow. When they reached Ephesus, Paul left Priscilla and Aquila behind there, but he himself went into the synagogue and addressed the Jews. When they asked him to stay longer, he would not consent, but said farewell to them and added, I will come back to you again if God wills. Then he set sail from Ephesus, and when he arrived at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church at Jerusalem, and then went down to Antioch. After he spent some time there, Paul left and went through the region of Galatia and Phygia. Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, arrived at Ephesus. He was an eloquent speaker, well versed in scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and with great enthusiasm he spoke and taught accurately the facts about Jesus. Although he knew only the baptism of John, he began to speak out fearlessly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. When Apollos wanted to cross over to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he insisted greatly those who had believed by grace, for he refuted the Jews vigorously in public debate, demonstrating from the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Well, I'm not sure what you noticed about Priscilla, but one of the things that stood out to me first was her strength. She and her husband, Aquila, 
were in Corinth only a short time after their Rome, uh, arrival from Rome because Emperor Claudius had expelled the Jews in 49 AD. In the Cultural Background Study Bible, it says what provoked the expulsion order was a conflict in the Jewish community over Christus, usually thought to be Jesus as the Christ. Leaders of the Jesus movement were probably among those forced to leave. So you see, um, uh, Luke is really taking time to help us understand that this is within the umbrella of Judaism, as Jesus was, Paul is, many of the characters are. They're trying to wrangle out, is Jesus really the Messiah, the one we've been looking for? So the ones forced to leave would include anyone in Rome who had um, been part of this controversy. Um, we know the Apostle Peter was there, and it's possible that Priscilla and Aquila were in contact with him, having heard the gospel from him and, and working with him. Scholars think that Priscilla may have been Gentile. Um, she has an aristocratic kind of Roman name. Um, but Aquila is definitely identified as being a Jewish man, originally from Pontus, and that's um, in modern day Turkey, um, along the southern coastline of the Black Sea. But both Priscilla and Aquila believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he fulfills the Hebrew scriptures, and they have put their faith in him. They're willing to leave everything behind to remain true to their faith. And essentially, they became refugees because when there's an edict and you have to leave, all of a sudden, you don't get a chance to sell your home or your business. You don't get to... Um, you know, pull up a moving truck and bring all your things with you. It's really kind of what you can carry. How many of you have moved from one state to another or one place to another? Yeah. It takes strength, doesn't it, to move for the journey, for physically carrying all those things that you want to bring with you. Strength emotionally to say goodbye to the people and that you love. Then there's all the nerves about learning to navigate a new place and then trying to find your sense of, of belonging and purpose in a place that feels unfamiliar. Well, Priscilla shows this kind of strength to us as she adapts to her new home and finds purpose in a new place. We learn one thing about her. She works right alongside of her husband in the tent making trade and I wondered, but it said when I researched it, that it is not uncommon for women to assist their husbands in the production and selling of goods. So they were craftspeople partners together. In the article entitled The Tentmaker Priscilla, I learned that it was likely that Aquila, Priscilla, and Paul made leather tents for the Roman government and private parties who ordered them. The Roman government required leather tents for housing its military on bases all over the empire. A canvas tent would not do, especially in the northern climates. And I guess being in the northern climates here, you might want a more sturdy tent if you needed to sleep on the go. The tools for leather work were easier to transport than the equipment needed to make canvas tents. And portability was key for Priscilla, Aquila, and Paul. Well, this couple opened their home to Paul, and all three of them worked together during the week and talked and grew together in their faith. And then on the Sabbath, on Saturdays, Paul would go to the synagogue with them and speak about Jesus. Then it tells us eventually Silas and Timothy met up with them and brought a financial gift from the churches in Macedonia, like the Philippian church. And that allowed Paul to set aside his tent making and preach the gospel on all the days of the week. So there were Priscilla and Aquila just doing the tent making work themselves, but it seems that they probably let Paul continue to stay with them and, and encouraged him and supported him, cooked his dinner when he came home. And he needed a nice warm meal and some encouragement. You heard a little piece of how it went for him. Some of the people he witnessed to opposed him and reviled him, which means they criticized him in an angry, insulting manner. 
that's a rough day. I think I'd rather make tents than be facing that on a daily basis. Well, Paul got so discouraged that the Lord actually sent him a vision to also encourage him, letting him know that God was with him, wanted him to be there, and would protect him because God had many people in the city. And two of those people were undoubtedly Priscilla and Aquila. In the book of Romans, which is written quite a bit later, and at the very end, you know how Paul likes to do all the greetings? This is what he sent in Romans 16, 3 and 4. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. And not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. So you can see that people all over knew Priscilla and Aquila, and they knew a story that we are not quite sure which one he's referring to, of how they saved Paul's life. Now, I don't know if it has to do with the, the dust up we see here with Gallio, where there's a, you know, um, Paul gets off, but then poor Sosthenes gets beat up because there's, the crowd is aggressive. We don't know who exactly is beating him up, but he's beaten right, right in the courtroom, and the judge is like, I don't care. So there's that in chapter 18 of Acts. And then if you go on and read chapter 19, uh, this is when Paul's in Ephesus. Um, and he gets into an even bigger scrape because the people there, there's a lot of people who work in the silver business and they have a temple to Diana and they get to sell little statues, kind of like souvenirs to all the people who come to their town of Diana. And so many people are becoming Christians that they get really angry and they like, we have to do something about this. And they stir up this huge riot and the whole city is like shouting and they're like, Paul, don't go in the Colosseum. Whatever you do, just like his friends are protecting him. And it could have been Priscilla and Aquila from pr protecting his life there. And then finally, the governors of the, of the city are like, settle down or the Romans are going to send in the troops. <laughs> and everything kind of disperses. Well, Priscilla and Aquila were so loyal to Paul that when he decides to leave Corinth after, shortly after this tr trial with Gallio, they decide to leave too and go to Ephesus with him. And it's a 350 mile journey away in a really different place um, on the Mediterranean. And then when they get there, Paul doesn't even stay more than a week with them. He just leaves them there in Ephesus. He speaks one time in the synagogue and then he's off to Jerusalem and then several other places. It seems like he's trusting Priscilla and Aquila to begin this ministry at Ephesus while he traveled. And I think it's really significant that in this chapter where they're covering so much Christian history, Luke takes the time to tell us what happens in Ephesus when Paul's not there, instead of telling us about all these other cities he's going to. So there's, there's something significant happening there under the ministry of Priscilla and Aquila. And it's, all the commentaries I read said it's significant that Priscilla's name is mentioned. And in first, when they talk about the couple in service, it shows that she's well known and honored in the Christian community. I was thinking about um, people that might be kind of modern day Priscilla's and my mind went right to Priscilla Shire. I don't know if any of you have heard of her, maybe, Craig and Kay Keith, because she's um, located in Dallas, Texas. Um, she's the daughter of Tony Evans, who's a well-known preacher and writer and speaker um, down there. But she also is a dynamic speaker, author, and a founder of a ministry called Going Beyond Ministries. She's written books like Discerning the Voice of God, The Armor of God, Awaken, God is able, breathe, that one's about Sabbath. The faithful, fervent, and a life interrupted. The, the subtitle for the book that was fervent is A Woman's Battle Plan for Serious, Specific, and Strategic Prayer. And that reminded me of the first place I ever saw Pris Priscilla Shire. She was in the movie called The War Room 
which is not a war movie. It's a movie about prayer because both she and her character portray how God works mightily in their lives as they just submit to him in prayer and <clears throat> work through really difficult situations and come out in the middle of God's will on the other side. But this is what Priscilla wrote, a little quote from her book, Life Interrupted. I want my life to radiate what happens when God has a person's heart at his full control. When every event or circumstance is simply another avenue to know him better and to show forth his glory. She's got that Christ-centered heart. I believe that Priscilla Shire and the Apostle Paul's friend Priscilla have this desire and this commitment in common. Having Christ at the center of our lives enables us to walk in strength and in for God's glory. And this is what I see in Acts 18 when Priscilla and Aquila meet Apollos at the synagogue in Ephesus. Apollos is a Jewish man, but he's from Alexandria, which is in Egypt. He knows the Hebrew scriptures, he knows about John the Baptist, and he knows some things about Jesus, and he has a gift for speaking. He's very eloquent and passionate. He wanted people in the synagogue to know all the things that he knew, so he spoke out fearlessly. Well, Priscilla and Aquila hear him, and they, they just kind of meet up with him, I think, after the, after the meeting. <clears throat> Take him aside so they're not calling him out or saying anything that might embarrass him. But they begin to explain the way of God to him a little bit more accurately and fully than what he had been speaking. And I feel like there's a lesson in that, because if we see things differently from another believer, we're not to be like, oh, we know the way, you're, you're all washed up, you know, you have it wrong. What if we did this like Priscilla and Aquila did and just kind of have a really great conversation and affirm what they have right and, and then show them maybe something we've also learned? I kind of picture them befriending him, having them over to his, their home and speaking with him, you know, just having questions and answers around the table as they share meals. Because Apollos becomes part of the believing family there in, in the Christian church in Ephesus. And it probably meets in Priscilla and Aquila's home. By the time Paul gets back to Ephesus, Apollos has already grown so much in the faith that he's already left on a mission trip to Greece, the very place we started the story of Acts 18. And two years have happened in the middle. Apollos took letters from the leaders of the church in Ephesus with him so that the believers in Corinth would recognize him as a responsible, trustworthy teacher and welcome him into the fellowship. So he was able to use his spiritual gifting for eloquent speaking and teaching in combination with the theological insights that he'd received in his time with Priscilla and Aquila to continue that conversation with the Jewish population in Corinth and to do so more effectively perhaps than what Paul had been able to do. So there's Paul, Apollos, Priscilla, Aquila, they're all longing for these people to come, for the fellow Jews to come to faith in Jesus as the anointed one who fulfills the promises of scripture. And they dedicated their lives to sharing this good news with everyone, whether they're Jewish or not, whether they're Gentiles, any ethnic background. And they rejoice with each new church family that is formed and strengthened. Priscilla and Aquila also reminded me of a husband and wife pastoral team that is really close to ours. They are in the First Baptist Church of South Londonderry, Vermont. Do you know Chris and Kathleen Blackie? Have you gotten a chance to meet them? They came to their church in February of 2010, just one year after they both graduated from seminary and were ordained as ministers. And then in August of the same year, the church building was destroyed by a fire. There's just this young couple with a little baby in arms, brand new in ministry, and the church just hung their head like, oh, they're going to leave for sure. But they didn't. Um, they stayed and they continued, and they had to use like the town meeting hall until they raised enough funds to rebuild. For four years, their parsonage doubled as the church office. 
And then as a congregation, all of them together gained a deep understanding of the church as people and not a building. Chris and Kathleen did learn a lot about the building process. They weren't, you know, familiar with construction, but they are now. And they have found creative ways to show love and hospitality to the people of South Londonderry, whether they're part of their church or not. Did you know that Chris serves as a volunteer fireman? And he also does weather reports. He's the West River weather guy. <laughs> He wants everyone to be safe, and so he'll tell you all about the storms that are coming. Meanwhile, Kathleen bakes sourdough bread every week to share with whomever God lays on her heart. Maybe a new mom, or someone who has lost a loved one, or someone she just meets at her children's school, someone who's going through a hard time or having a financial difficulty. They have three children now, and I love that they chose to name their youngest daughter Priscilla. Like Chris, Kathleen, Priscilla and Aquila have made connections and opened their home to bless whoever they are with. The hospitality flows from a deep love in their heart for God and for their neighbors. The greeting that Paul writes at the end, I give you a little piece of it to that book of, in Romans concludes with these words, Greet also the church that meets in Priscilla and Aquila's house. Apparently, they left Ephesus and went back to Rome once the edict was lifted and it was safe to live there again. No matter where they moved and where they lived, they did so open-heartedly, sharing their home and the truth of God with whoever was willing to come and join them and receive God's grace. It's hard to keep starting over. It requires a lot of intention and a lot of love to create a home and a new place. Once you've done it, it requires even more love to open that home to other people and let God use it for his purposes. Um, when Matthew and I were first married, we lived in Omaha, Nebraska, where he was in medical school, and we had a couple who was kind of like a mentor couple from our church, and they opened their home to all of us young married couples. And we just learned so much from them and were so blessed by being with them. We wanted to do that where, wherever we went, and God took us a lot of places. <laughs> we moved to Virginia and Wisconsin and Rhode Island and Maine and Prince Edward Island and Pennsylvania and then we finally landed here in Vermont. <laughs> we want our home to be a place that feels welcoming, and I hope that you feel welcomed to be there, and that you will come and do life with us, and I hope that you want your house and home to be like that, a place of love, a place where people can talk about real things that matter and our spiritual friendships. So I, I hope that Priscilla and Aquila's um, way of being is inspiring to you. A Christ-centered life is vibrant with strength and wisdom and love. It doesn't mean that it's going to be full of, free from difficulty, but it will be full of grace. This is the kind of life Priscilla and Aquila lived. Their marriage and their choices were a living demonstration of God's redemptive heart. And it's a beautiful witness of God's work in our lives, too, when we let Christ be the center. We'll be united to him, and we'll be able to connect deeply with the heart of the Father and with each other as we approach one another this way. So how might God be inviting you this morning to live with Christ at the very center of your life? Maybe you could use your bulletin and a pencil in your pew to write, Write down one thing that stands out to you from this morning's message and ask the Holy Spirit to show you how he would like to do this thing that he's inviting you to do in your own life. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, thank you for inviting all of us, regardless of our gender or our background, into the mighty story that you are writing, the redemptive one about love, Help us to enter it um, being willing to be having you at the center 
to lean into your strength and let it fill us, to rely on your wisdom and to share it humbly and graciously. And Lord, to have love at the center as we open our hearts and our homes to one another. Thank you for this example this morning and for the invitation that you're extending to us even today. Help us to follow through on that, to be willing to have a servant heart like you did and to be blessed in the friendships that you had when you were here on earth and the ones that are inspired by your life and filled with your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. This is um, based on Romans 16, 25, and 27 from the message. May our praise rise to the one who is powerful enough to make us strong, wise, and loving. May we grow more centered in Jesus Christ and be united to each other by a spirit of gracious servanthood. May our lives rise as worship, guided by the Holy Spirit and the example of Jesus to our un incomparably strong, wise, loving Father in heaven. Amen.